Hello and welcome back to our exploration of the 1901 Pan American Medals of Herman Atkins McNeil. My name is White Cross and once again I'll be your host on this journey. In the first video of this series, we discuss McNeil's medals and the medals of two other giants of American numismatics, Augustus St. Gaudens and Adolf Weinman. In the context of the World's Fairs for which these medals were all created, we looked at the disparity between the number of medals created and the perceived numbers of surviving examples. In part two of this series, we'll discuss efforts to acquire examples of McNeil's elusive medals. We'll use the creation of the census of another enigmatic medal, also released at the turn of the century, the Lesher Referendum Dollars, as a template for recording the McNeil medals. We'll take a brief look at our new website dedicated to recording the existing examples of the McNeil medals. Once again, that is panamcensus.com. Before examining the census as it stands today, making note of some of the data that we have documented during the recording of these examples and the implications of the census for those wishing to acquire examples for their own collections. I acquired my first Pan American medal in an online auction in 2016 after about a six-month search. It's a bronze medal in its original velvet-lined box, awarded to A.W. Thompson, whose exhibit is listed as prehistoric implements in the exhibition guides. The medal surpassed all of my expectations. Again, images and even video footage just don't do these medals justice. They are stunning in hand. I immediately began searching for a silver medal to complement the bronze. That quest confirmed the perceived scarcity of the silver medals, but I finally found this gorgeous example at Heritage Auctions in June of 2017. This medal is graded MS-63 by NGC, and it's one of only 14 mint state silver or even silvered bronze examples so far certified by NGC. It's also the most attractively toned that I've come across so far in my work in the census. I subsequently acquired an NGC MS-63 graded gilt example. This one awarded to the Mobile Company of America. You can see they're struck in Exerg. They were early pioneers in the American steam automobile industry. Finally acquiring the bronze, silver, and gilt examples of the medals reignited my interest in uncovering the number of remaining pieces for all three. At about the same time that I purchased my bronze example, I came across a website dedicated to documenting another interesting and intriguing issue which dates from the exact period of time as the 1901 Pan American medals, the Lesher Referendum Dollars, and the website lesherdollars.com. I'm fortunate to have this PCGS AU55 example of the enigmatic Lesher dollar. It's an octagonal dollar-sized privately minted silver medal created as an advertising vehicle and also as a way to spur demand for native Colorado silver. Coincidentally, most of these medals, perhaps more accurately called tokens, are dated the same year as the Pan American Medals 1901. But more importantly, the Lesher dollars and the Pan American Medals all have unique identifiers. On the Pan American medals, the recipient's name again is die struck in exerg down here below. And on the Lesher referendum dollars, the name of the businesses that purchase the, the tokens is generally struck here at the bottom of the obverse. This one also numbered. You can see this one is for a J.M. Slusher of Crickle Creek, Colorado. Finally, like the Pan American medals, the original mintage of the Lesher dollars is low but uncertain. Lesher was a bit of a P.T. Barnum character, and he told former American Numismatic Association President Ferrand Zerbe in 1914 that he had struck between 3,000 and 3,500 medals. You'll recall that number closely approximates the original reported 3,193 Pan American medal count. But Lesher expert Adna Wild estimated that Lesher really probably only struck about half that figure, perhaps 1,870 pieces. Interestingly, that figure closely approximates the United States' final Pan American medal count of 1,826. Both Serbian and Wild contributed to the study of the Lesher dollars, identifying six types and 12 varieties. Their work and the unique identifiers of many of the Lesher dollars allowed for the creation of the dynamic census of their surviving examples, which once again can be found at lesherdollars.com. Per that census, there are approximately 580 known, known survivors of the medal. 
Some types are quite rare or even unique, but the percent of survivors is either as low as 18% based on Lesher's seemingly high estimated of 3,000 to 3,500 pieces struck, or as high as 31% based on Adna Weil's more conservative estimate of 1,870 pieces. Their near identical age, estimated minages, and critically that unique name on each of the Lesher referendum and Pan American medals offers at least a vague apples to apples comparison. If Lesher's own production estimate is accurate and the 18% survival rate holds true, the reported 3,193 minage of Pan American medals suggests there should be around 500 Pan American medals still in existence. But if we assume that many of the medals awarded to winners outside of our borders never resurfaced, then the U.S. Pan American medal count at 1,826 compares well to Adna Wilde's more conservative estimate of 1,870 Lesher referendum dollars struck. Applying the 31% survival rate to that U.S. Pan American medal count would still yield around 500 surviving Pan American medals. But the effort and cost it took to acquire the examples before you of the Pan American medal seems to suggest that far fewer than 500 examples still exist. Once again, where are they? Standing on the shoulders of the Lesher Dollar Census, I began the process of creating a census of existing Pan American medals. The first step was determining criteria for inclusion, and that criteria centered around images of the medals more than anything else for several different reasons. First, clear images of the obverse allows for accurately recording the recipient's name, reducing the possibility of duplication. Second, color images are important in determining metal composition because unlike the silver-only Lesher issues, an identical design was used for bronze, silver, and gilt on the Pan American issues, and it can be difficult to tell which metal is which in a black and white photograph. There are examples of exhibitors who won medals in more than one metal. For example, the General Electric Company medal you see here was also awarded in silver to General Electric. Third, recent images increased the likelihood that the metal is still in existence. Our search uncovered a few examples of metals with images 50 years old or older, but with no recent corroboration. Unfortunately, attrition is part of our hobby, and images and sources no older than maybe 25 years ensures a more accurate census. And while not strictly necessary for the metal count, clear reverse images allow for better identification and for additional notes on condition, which is something we'll touch on a little bit later. These criteria are a little bit limiting. For example, Marcus's own plate coin is not only black and white, it is nearly 30 years old itself, and it is obverse only. But given the identical nature of the metals and other factors, I felt the criteria is important for creating an accurate census. The sources I used in my research included current and closed auction listings, past posts on coin-related online forums, museum websites, and websites dedicated to McNeil and other medalists and artists of the era. I also emailed authors and museum collection managers and curators. I recorded the medals that I found alphabetically by recipient's name and by metal type. I also recorded the observable conditions of each metal, whether graded and encapsulated by a third-party grader, which of course we call slabbed in the vernacular of the numismatists, or if it was ungraded and raw, again, what we call a coin that has not been certified yet. I also recorded the source, the price at which mo the metals most recently sold, if applicable, and other related details. Finally, I assigned each metal a unique census number. Sometimes I found the same metal in different circumstances, raw, then certified or slabbed, in one auction and then another auction, but after about four years of research, the discovery of metals new to my searches grew less frequent. You'll find much of this data on the website panamcensus.com. In the upper right corner of the site, you'll find a drop-down menu under the title Metal Census. In this menu, you'll find an option for each metal type, bronze, silver, gilt, and gold medals, and even exonumia related directly to the McNeil medals. 
Each of these options will take you to the respective metals page with an embedded spreadsheet containing each of the observed examples within that type, including the metal winner's name. And it's important to note that the definite article has been placed at the end of each named metal to aid in alphabetizing where appropriate. For example, the Mobile Company of America gilt medal you see here is listed in the gilt census as Mobile Company of America, comma, the. We also included whether the metal is raw or graded and encapsulated, and if so, the certification service used in the grade assigned. And finally, the metal's unique Pan Am Census ID number is listed. Pan Am Census also contains additional information about the metals themselves, a short biography of Herman Atkins McNeil, a brief look at the pan, which was of course the backdrop for these metals, a small photo gallery with some examples of the metals, and even the aforementioned separate census of related exonumia for items directly related to these metals, such as dye trials, plaster maquettes, and the like. You'll also find links to the video you are currently watching and the article upon which these videos were based with complete and extensive footnotes and additional references. And of course, you'll find an invitation to submit your examples of the 1901 Pan American Medals by McNeil so that they can also be included in the census. Note that the census is for examples of these medals only and does not include merchant medals, so-called dollars, encased coins, or other souvenirs and medals, which often mimic the McNeil designs, especially the obverse here, but that are not actually the medals whose examples you've seen in this video. While I want to reiterate, this research is preliminary, ongoing, and may never be 100% complete. I believe we have at least the foundation of a census and some early observations worth sharing with the numismatic community. Some of the early findings from this research are expected, but some are eye-opening. A few of the most interesting findings follow here. Number one, as predicted, there appear to be very few survivors. Only 95 unique metals have been found to date across all three metal types. 29 bronze, 37 silver, 27 gilt, and of course the two solid gold medals we've talked about here. Two, surprisingly, with a reported population of 37 silver survivors outnumber any other metal. There were more silver medal diplomas originally awarded, about 23% more than gilt, but only about 1% more than the bronze medals. Third, there are far more uncertified pieces documented than certified. Only around 30 examples so far have been found to be graded and encapsulated by a third-party grader. That figure is, of course, about one-third of the total number of examples found to date. Fourth, of those certified, around 20% are below mint state or are details graded, that is, with condition issues severe enough to prevent them from receiving a numeric grade on the Sheldon grading scale. If dealers and knowledgeable collectors tend to submit to third-party graders, those pieces they have determined have a higher chance at straight grading, it seems reasonable that this 20% figure comes from a population that is already pre-screened for quality and condition, at least to an extent. Fifth, as a corollary to the number four, Uncertified examples seem to have a higher incidence of observable condition issues. These condition issues are as common as noticeable large rim bumps or harsh cleanings and even gouges, but we have even observed examples with holes all the way through them or soldered bales and chains. For uncertified examples, issues appear on about 25% of the metals documented to date. I'd like to stress that I am by no means a professional coin grader, but I believe that that percentage is conservative when obvious issues can be observed from small or grainy historic issue, uh, images. It stands to reason carefully, careful examination by professional graders would probably reveal issues in even greater numbers. Six, earlier, we question whether our theoretical beginning medal count should include pieces awarded to American exhibitors only, recall that figure was 1,826, or if it should include medals awarded to all exhibitors, including those from other countries, with that familiar figure of 3,193. 
the supposition being that those awarded outside of our borders would be less likely to have survived or appeared in recent domestic auctions and sales. Thankfully, our research has uncovered several medals originally awarded to entities outside of our borders, which have in fact appeared in recent U.S. auctions and collections. They include Negociacion Minera Candelaria y Anexis, Chilon Harmanos, the silver medal awarded to the Bolivian government, and of course the aforementioned solid 24 karat gold Campania Cigarera Mexicana medals, among others. This suggests a larger beginning population closer to that entire original metal count rather than just the smaller U.S. metal count. But this means that the number of survivors is considerably smaller in terms of percentages. In other words, if the discovery and inclusion of metals originally awarded to entities outside of U.S. borders means the original 3,193 metal count is the correct original population of metals from which all of our examples appear, a figure of approximately 100 survivors means that as few as 3% to 4% of the metals originally issued survive today based on our preliminary findings. And with only 95 example, examples documented to date, few graded by third-party graders and condition issues significant to prohibit straight grading on perhaps 25% or more of surviving metals, the number of original, undamaged pieces in Mint State 60 or above appears to be exceptionally low. Perhaps 20 or fewer examples of each metal type. Even the solid gold Eldridge R. Johnson Victor talking machine specimen, one of only two examples known struck in solid gold, is graded AU details by NGC. An eighth, we hope and can assume that many additions will be made to the census over the coming months and years. But as it stands, the number of known examples could literally double for each of the four metal types, that is, bronze, silver, gilt, and even gold. And all four metal types would remain R5 on the Sheldon Rarity Scale, with only 31 to 75 examples known. Some final thoughts and some conclusions and area for further study. While stressing the preliminary nature of this data and hoping that new census and website will bring previously unknown examples of the metals to light, the number of surviving examples we have documented is quite small. Of a supposed minage of 3,193 metals, fewer than 100 have been observed, a remarkably low figure, again, of less than 3%. And of those survivors, a quarter to a half appear to have issues or wear commensurate with a technical grade below Mint State 60. So the low incidence of problem-free metals is really not surprising given the 120-year history of these metals originally issued and, of course, remaining for decades outside of the numismatic community. And if cleaning and polishing coins wasn't that uncommon in the last century within our community, Cleaning and polishing bronze and silver objects of virtue outside of the community was really more the norm. Ultimately, based on the research as it stands today, and especially compared to the similar age and mintage of the Lesher referendum dollars with its documented existing population, we must question whether awarded equals minted for the Pan American medals. Barring discovery of a more definitive source, which we genuinely hope comes to light and for which we will continue to search, it seems likely that the number of 1901 Pan American medals actually minted must have been smaller than the original figure of 3,193 pieces for whom diplomas were awarded. Extrapolating that figure based on the lesser dollars may be a bridge too far for some numismatists, especially with the hope and understanding that more McNeil medals should come to light with this new census. But if we average the 18% survival rate of the lesser dollars based on the estimates of Zerbi and the 31% as suggested by Wild for perhaps a 25% figure, our approximate 100 surviving examples of the McNeil medals suggests an original total mintage of no more than 400 to perhaps 500 examples total across all three metal types. Finally, 
in addition to our hope that many other McNeil medals come to light and will be counted in this census, we hope that admirers of other coins and medals will be inspired, inspired to create a census of their own for the pieces that they are passionate about. It is my hope the numismatic community will benefit from and contribute to this detailed accounting and that a better understanding and census of the surviving medals will increase interest and help the 1901 Pan American Exposition Medals of Herman Atkins McNeil become better recognized as the treasures of American numismatic art and American history that I believe them to be.